English people. Please uh, open up your Bibles now. Turn to me. Turn with me to <laughs> the. Uh, don't turn to me. Turn to the Word of God. Um, turn to uh, Song of Songs, chapter four, verse one to eleven. This is number six. Sixth sermon on the Song of Songs. Number eight in the summer sermon series that we're doing. Last week, Mike Muir at the beach talked about Galatians chapter 5, the desires of the spirit versus the desires of the flesh. And uh, yeah, we're going to get back into the Song of Songs here. So the next couple weeks will be on chapter 4. All right. Lord, please anoint your word. Come in, come in your mercy, Holy Spirit, and give us uh, revelation and understanding of your word. Lord, we invite you to come and touch our hearts. Uh, we ask you to move, Lord, beyond the human dimension of the speaking and the, the hearing, but that your spirit would be working and we would really heart to heart uh, meet with you this morning, Lord, hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, um, I'm reading from NIV 1984. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. Until the day breaks and shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Senir, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of the leopards. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon. The word of the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we're going to keep going with chapter 4 uh, next time. I just think there's, there's too much in here to reasonably uh, cover all of it in a sermon of any reasonable length um, today. So, so we're 11. Um, is this okay, this thing? It's kind of, I feel like it's a little bit high, but is it okay? Kind of floating. Okay, what's the context of this passage? One of the, um, one of the assumptions that I'm making in interpreting the Song of Songs is that it's a coherent story that you can read the Song of Songs as a story all the way through. And it's basically the story of this woman uh, who represents the church, uh, sincere believers, followers of the Lord. Um, and it's the story of her growth in love, in mature love, as she matures in her love for her lover or for God, for Jesus. That's basically the, the overarching story. And so far we looked at um, chapters one, Two, the first part of chapter 2, it focused a lot on intimacy. You saw a lot of uh, times of intimacy where the, the beloved and the lover were together. Um, she was experiencing a lot of security and delight in his presence and in his love for her. And in chapter 2, verse 8, um, he comes along and he challenges her to get, get past the level of her comfort zone, to come away with him to the mountains. Um, he refuses. He, he's inviting her there to a deeper level, a further level of intimacy, 
uh, living as Jesus' partner. He wants her to come on the mountains of, of the world with him, the, the kingdoms of the nations, the challenges and the hardships. He, he wants her to come and be his partner on the mountains. And she says, go, turn, turn away, go yourself to the mountains. And she decides to stay in the, in the house by herself. And then she's struggling because she experiences his loving discipline that he withdraws his presence from her and she can't find him. And she's really distraught and she goes through this whole desperate search for him. Finally, she decides to get up and she responds to what he had asked her to do. She, she does arise finally and she goes out. She doesn't go all the way to the mountains, but she goes out and, and then uh, she's searching for him and finally she finds him again. He comes back to her and she takes him home and makes this deeper level of commitment. She brings him to her mother's house. And then, she, and then there's this vision of the wedding, of the wedding chariot. Uh, that was the last part of chapter 3 that we were looking at the last time we did this. And um, she sees Solomon's wedding chariot. Uh, and it is so... Um, it's surrounded by 60 mighty warriors. And it describes all the construction of this chariot. And this emphasizes the safety of, of his leadership. The safety that the bride will have as she goes through life, as she's carried in this carriage together with her bridegroom. And so he gives this revelation in response to her fear because she was afraid to go to the mountains with him. She didn't fully trust in his leadership. Um, she couldn't really go there. So he gives this revelation of the safety of the strength and the power of being with him. You know, 60 warriors, all carefully trained, all of them having their sword, uh, you know, against the terrors of the night, ready to fight and defend. And, and protect. So this is what she's just had, this vision, and we saw her making this commitment to him. So that was basically the occasion of their wedding, the wedding ceremony and procession as well at the end of chapter 3. And it's in chapter 4 that he starts calling her my bride, as Dolly was uh, pointing out at the beginning of our, our worship session there. Um, now now they're, they're officially sort of married, the covenant has been, has been sealed um, as far as their ceremony goes. And, uh, and now we see a deeper level. What happens today is that the lover who represents Jesus um, starts pouring out his heart and how he feels about his bride. And um, you know, again, if we're thinking about this in terms of the allegorical reading of the Song of Songs, which is another interpretive move that we're making, right? To read this in terms of our relationship with God. This is how God, God, pours out the way that he feels about his church. The way that he feels about, about sincere believers, people who are, who are believing, who are following him and committed to him in the way that this woman is committed to her lover. And, and it starts out in verse 1. Um, I, I want to look at another, see if I have another, no. I don't really like the NIV translation as much here. Um, other translations that are a bit more literal, they will say, behold, you are beautiful. My darling, behold, you are beautiful. You know, that's the, the word in Hebrew is like behold or look. And I'm not sure who he's telling to look, but it sounds to me like he's telling her to look. Behold. I mean, he's just, he's looking at her and her beauty is just overwhelming him to the point that all he can do is, is exclaim. You are beautiful. You are so beautiful. And the, these are the, the opening words of this. And the lover then goes on to point, to describe her beauty. See, he's not, he's not a superficial uh, lover. He's very attentive to her, her unique features. And he actually goes on and lists all these different features. I think it's, uh, how many? We've got eight different points of beauty that he specifically mentions. And by the way, you know, we're reading this mostly in the allegorical fashion, but there's a lot of things that we can learn about natural human love from this passage too, right? Um, and one of them being this ability to sort of study the beauty of the one that you love and to be noticing and attentive to the particular things about, uh, about especially advice for guys, because at this point it's the lover speaking about the beauty of, of, of his uh, beloved. Um, right, so, uh, so he appreciates her unique features, her unique beauty. 
It's not just a generic kind of thing. Okay, so let's look at these. Let's look at these. He starts out with her eyes. Okay, a good place to start. Right? Start with the eyes. <laughs> right? The eyes are this point of contact, soul to the windows of the soul, right? Um, he says, your eyes behind your veil are doves. I'm going to talk us through each of these features just briefly, some of the symbolism, and we're using scripture to interpret scripture. So how do these things come up? And, and we've already talked about some of these earlier because he, he mentioned some of these features earlier in a shortened form. But this time he's really going and, and laying them all out. And, uh, and he says, your eyes are like doves. Now doves in the Bible are a symbol of purity. They're a, sy a symbol of, of singleness, of focus. Okay, um, people talk about how doves vision so that they can only stare in one direction, straight ahead sort of thing. So people talk about doves, purity, loyalty, singleness of focus. They're behind a veil. So the veil speaks of modesty, okay? Her, her, her modesty and her eyes as doves is this pure, loyal focus toward him. Something that he really appreciates about her. Um, then he goes on to talk about her hair, okay? And I don't know how many women feel like you would be moved by this kind of a compliment. Your hair is like a flock of goats coming down a mountain. So, so a lot of people, we, we like this kind of agricultural uh, uh, visions and terminology would be pretty familiar in a society in which this was written. Maybe not so much to us today, but I think you have to get into this a little bit, right? Try to imagine, try to imagine a flock of goats, what that would look like, dark colored goats sort of descending from a mountain. You know, you would see kind of waves, and the way the light is reflecting off of the, the coat of these goats would be shimmering and all these beautiful, right? And it would be kind of a, a, a rhythmic, kind of wavy pattern. I think her hair is kind of naturally wavy and curly, and he really appreciates the way that the sun shines off of her hair. And one one uh, kind of translation that gets a little bit more um, creative says, your head of tumultuous curls, right? <laughs> But, but it's, it's her unique, it's her unique hair. It's the way that she, he likes her hair, right? He appreciates her hair. And in scripture, we can think of a few different meanings of hair. One is, anyone think of hair in the Bible? The Nazarite vow is one particular place where hair is emphasized. And there, the hair is, is grown long. When someone makes a special commitment of consecration to God, they, they grow their hair long. And then at the end of the consecration, they cut off and they kind of offer their hair to God. It's a sign of their consecration, of their devotion, of their special devotion to him. Um, we can think about hair in, in the context of Paul talking about a woman's hair as a, uh, a woman's glory. Long hair for a woman is, is her glory. It's also a sign of submission. And in the Bible, submission is linked with beauty. And we need to know this, especially in our relationship to God, that as we, as we submit to God, as we consecrate ourselves to God, it is a very beautiful thing to him. And he really takes it personally. He appreciates how we do that. Okay, next he moves to her teeth. And we get three, three out of eight features have to do with her mouth area. So her lips, her teeth, her mouth as a whole, he talks about. He starts with the teeth. And this is, a, this is again, a kind of one that, we might not work that well today as a compliment, but in the time, it was really... Uh, uh, so what does he notice? Your teeth are like a flock of sheep, just shorn, coming up from the washing. So you imagine uh, sheep that are just shorn, they look really clean. And not only have they been shorn of all that wool, all that kind of heavy wool that gets kind of dirty, but they've also been washed. They've been shorn and they've been washed. So they're really clean. He's saying, your teeth are really clean. I really appreciate how clean your teeth are. And I really appreciate how you're not missing any teeth. Because not one of them is alone, right? Each one has its pair. And this would be a little bit of a rare, relatively rare thing in those days. I mean, hygiene, dental hygiene was not anywhere near as advanced as today. And people would kind of lose their teeth. But she's got all her teeth and they're, they're bright and sparkling. He's really impressed by this. I mean, think about today, how much money gets spent on uh, your mouth. Actually, people spend a lot of money on their lips, right? There was just this, there's this plastic surgery place that's close to my house on Urban Fisher Hallman, and it was talking about how you can plump up your lips. Uh, I don't even know what that, but you know, they basically come in with lasers and they kind of like 
make your lips all swell up and stuff. And people spend all so much money on having a white and sparkling smile and your lips. And right, this is a very important feature. I mean, we think about the fact that she he can see her teeth. That suggests that she's smiling. So, right? Otherwise, how would he see her teeth? So that's also has to do with it here that she's smiling and and you know for women. If you're, if you're with a guy and you know, you've got a husband or a committed uh, person, and um, one thing that guys really appreciate is when women laugh at their jokes. Right? So here we've got a woman who, who laughs at her lover's jokes, right? She, uh, I mean, I assume it's genuine, kind of a smile. She's smiling. She's really happy. She's really joyful to be with him, and, and he can see her teeth. And, and we look at, think about teeth and um, in the Bible, what are teeth? Well, what are teeth used for in general? They're used to, to chew things, right? They're used to eat. And so it's really important that we have healthy teeth in a spiritual sense to chew the food of the Word of God. Um, right? So that we can... Jesus talked about, unless you chew and eat my flesh, there's no life in you in John 6. Talked about the importance of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And so teeth are very important. They're very important in a spiritual sense that we are chewing God's word. And I think that's what spiritually this speaks of. You know, the ability to chew healthy way of coming and, and ingesting the word of God, the, the bread of life. Okay, so there's that aspect of it too. And then lips. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Um, so he appreciates the red kind of uh, reddish color and, and uh, I don't know, smooth, silky texture of her lips. He, think, he finds that very appealing, another appealing feature of hers. Scarlet ribbon in scripture, there's one other place where it talks about a scarlet ribbon. Anyone know where that is? Rahab, right? Think about Rahab. And she was to tie a scarlet ribbon in her window so when the Israelite soldiers came in to, the, to Jericho, they would, uh, they would spare her and her family. So it speaks of her faith and her redemption. Um, so when we're talking about, when Jesus is talking about the church, and he's talking about her teeth and her lips and her mouth, it has to do with, first of all, again, we talked about chewing the word of God, so receiving the word of God, receiving that revelation, but then speaking speaking the word back. And, you know, if you look through scripture, I started to do this. How many times scripture focuses on the words that we speak and how important that is to God? So I could just give you a few examples, but Revelation 12, 11, it talks about how, how believers, how the saints overcome the evil one. How do they do it? By the word of their testimony. By the word of their testimony. The way that they speak out their faith. And they speak out the truth of God. They give testimony of God, of the truth of God. Uh, we could talk about the importance of confessing with your mouth. We could talk about speech being seasoned with the salt of the covenant. We could speak about James chapter 3, verse 9 to 12, where James talks about um, the tongue and, and the lips and the, the mouth being a source of water. And he talks about different kinds of water that can come out of our mouth. Um, it can be kind of like bitter tainted um, salt water that's not very good to drink, not particularly refreshing, right? And, or it can be a fresh, like springs, like fresh springs of water that come out from our mouth as we, as we praise God and as we say things to build and edify other people. Speech is very important. Um, the scripture talks about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7 as streams of living water that flow from your belly, that flow from within you. Uh, streams of living water, and I think they're flowing out of your mouth. And we're, we're not talking about vomiting here. We're talking about, right, we're talking about the living water, the Holy Spirit flowing from within you and coming out in your speech so that the praises of God can be declared and so that words that can edify and that can build up and that can honor other people are coming out of. And God, the point is that God notices these things, and to God they're very important. And God's heart is very moved. By these things. Okay, the next one is her temples. Now, temples, her temples, he says, your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Anyone ever cut open a pomegranate? Look at the two halves. They're, what color are they? 
they're really red. They're a really rich kind of reddy, orange, pinky kind of uh, very vibrant color. So her temples, which speaks of like the upper part of her, her cheeks, it's basically, and other translations do translate this as cheeks, this represents her emotions that are showing through. And she's letting the color of, I'm not sure why, she's kind of blushing. She's, uh, I don't know if, she's, if this shows her, her modesty again or, or it's kind of showing her passion. The color is rising in her cheeks and he sees this and he delights in it. Think about this from a spiritual point of view that as she is receiving God's word and she's receiving the revelation, she's chewing on that and she's speaking out and her emotions before God are a beautiful thing as her emotions are being expressed and he's noticing her feelings and he's, he's noticing her passion and her feelings that are being expressed. Um, then he talks about her neck and this is another unique feature of this particular woman. I think she's got a really long neck because he says your neck is like a tower. It's like a tower of David, right? Your neck is like a tower with, uh, built with elegance. But this tower is like the tower of David and it's got a thousand shields of warriors hanging from it. And I was trying to figure out like, what would that be like? Like a woman whose neck looks like a tower with a thousand shields hanging on it? What's going on there? But I think it's her hair again. I think it's the way that her hair is accentuating her and those curls, those kind of curly, powerful. She looks like a warrior to him, you know? You're like a war, the shields of warriors. Your neck is like the tower. This is military language, speaking of David. And we know that in the Bible, the neck, again, speaks of the will. It speaks of the person's will. Okay, so sometimes God will talk about having a stiff neck, that when God wants to pull you in a certain direction, your neck is resist, you resist, right? Like a donkey that resists when you try to pull on the, the leash or the tether of the donkey, and the donkey's neck is very stiff because it's resisting. It's trying to go in the opposite direction. It won't let you pull where, where you want it to go, okay? But this woman's neck, so our neck speaks of our will. And her will is so steadfastly set on the purposes of God and on the things of Jesus that he's just overwhelmed by it. He's like, you're like, you're like a warrior in the way that your heart is set, your will is set on my purposes, on, on following me and obeying me. And I think that that's what, that's what, from the spiritual perspective, God is talking about here. Okay, the last one. And so we, so we looked at about, um, how many? Six out of eight features have to do with her face, her face and head area. And then he moves to her neck and he talks about her breasts. He says that her breasts are like uh, two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies. And you know, I'm, if you're trying to imagine this, how does this comparison work? Well, um, I, I mean, young, young fawns, they're kind of youthful. Maybe they're, her breasts are a little bit perky. Um, they're, they're twin fawns, you know, she may not be a, I mean, it's her unique beauty, right? That he appreciates of her. Um, they're, they're soft, I mean, they're gentle, twin fawns, kind of speaks of that, right? They're, I, I, I'm not totally sure how, to, how much to go into here on this, but, um, you know, what do we think about uh, uh, breasts as far as scripture goes? Well, um, one thing we talk about is milk. I mean, there's the, we could think of breasts as nourishment, right? And clearly, um, that, that's, <laughs> I mean, that's one aspect, right? That I think, I think the Lord um, appreciates that about the church, her ability to nourish and, and uh, uh, you know, spiritual babes. We talk about the milk of the, of the word that spiritual babies are to, uh, to crave and to desire and to go after, right? Uh, the milk of the word that the church that, that believers provide to nourish others. We could talk about breasts in that way. But breasts in the, in the scripture are also meant as a source of delight. Um, so Proverbs um, chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. This may not be a, a verse that you expected to hear at coming to church today, but we are in the Song of Songs, and this is also by Solomon. And here, this is a, 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 the exhortation to a man to be faithful to his partner, to not go after um, other people, to not go after an adulterous woman. And he says, you know, why don't you be satisfied by your partner, by the partner of your youth. He says, she is a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her rest satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. 
Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? So here we clearly see that breasts are intended by God. There's multiple purposes. One of them is to provide delight and, uh, and satisfaction to, and, and scripture is kind of not really um, hiding that. I mean, I think it's interesting, like for me as a man speaking, I don't have breasts, but um, my wife does. And I find that a very, it's a very kind of curious and appealing thing because it's something that's distinctly feminine. It's something that women have and men don't have. I mean, men sometimes get a bit chubby and have, but they're not even so, right? They're not really, uh, they're not really breasts in the sense of that a woman would have, right? And um, there's just something very delightful about a woman's breasts. And I don't know if women understand that or appreciate that about themselves, but from the perspective of a man and, and for your husband or, or future husband, you know, just knowing this is maybe important for you as well. Um, so these are the ones that are, that are listed here, the specific features. Now, later on in the song, we get more features, and he actually progresses down and, and observes other features of her body. But today we most, mostly focus on the face and down to the neck and, and the breasts. And what are we seeing here? We see this lover who is very attentive and who's very studious who's very appreciative of his beloved's features and what she's like. And we think about how these features can represent things spiritually. Okay, they have, they have a, a symbolic value. They speak of these things in scripture. And we think about God delighting in us because this is Jesus speaking to his church. Right? And how he delights and how he appreciates all these things about us. All these things that we do. And, I mean, one thing that I wanted to be careful about here is that the, the, the worry here that we could be talking about, like works righteousness and, and that God, we're kind of uh, earning our salvation or we're earning God's love or something like that. So I want to do a little bit to get clear on that, what, how, how we should interpret this, I think, in the context of grace. God is speaking to people who love him and who obey him. That is, he's speaking to people who are receiving his grace. Because that's the basis of our relationship with the Lord. That we receive free gift of grace, free gift of righteousness. But within grace, God's love also makes us beautiful. So Ephesians 5 speaks of um, Christ nourishing the church and washing her with water through the cleansing of the word. Um, it speaks of Christ. Uh, wanting to present to himself a bride that's uh, free from, from any blemish or spot um, before him. And uh, so, so we know that out of the love that we have, um, this movement, movement of love back to the Lord, the movements of our heart back to the Lord, and the ways that we act in obedience in response to his grace and his love. These are not things that earn us salvation in any way, but they're also at the same time very important to the Lord. Do you know that the Lord really cares when you pray to him? Do you know that the Lord is moved when you pay attention to him, when you turn your heart towards him, when you do things, even small things, in obedience to him? when you show these features. So the Lord is talking to this woman and you know, at this point, she still hasn't gone all the way in her obedience because she hasn't gone to the mountains yet. And I think that's what happens in the next verse. So maybe we'll, we'll go there, okay? So I read this verse, verse six, which in a way it interrupts the flow because everything else is the lover speaking and talking about how much he appreciates her and how much he appreciates her love. And that continues on verse seven. But we get this verse in the middle and it says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Who's talking here? Well, it, it could be, it could be the lover talking. But if we look at how this was coming up in the earlier parts of the song, this exact same thing. This is what he challenged her to do. He said, come away with me to the mountains. 
And she told him, no, my lover, turn and go to the mountains by yourself. So now I think what's going on is that she is hearing him pouring out his love for her. And her heart, she's had this vision of the wedding chariot and the security and the safety of his love. And she's now hearing him pour out his, his affection, his affirmation of her and of her beauty. And her heart is now totally moved. He says, I'm going. I'm going to the mountains with you. I'm willing to go. I'm going to go to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of incense. I mean, just reading this in the context, I think this makes the most sense that it's her speaking here. And she's expressing now her willingness to go with him, to come away with him, to go to the mountains with him together, to be his partner in the hard places, in the difficult, uh, challenging, dark places. Because she talks about until, until the um, shadows flee. So we're talking about nighttime. We're talking about it's, it's dark, it's scary, it's a difficult place. Uh, this is symbolized by the mountain of myrrh, because we, th we think about the, the myrrh symbolism, which we've covered already here. Remember what myrrh symbolizes? Anybody? Myrrh? Yeah? Leah? Uh, like anointing dead people. It's a burial spice. It's a burial spice, and, and symbolically it represents Jesus' death. It represents suffering and death. So when she talks about a mountain of myrrh, I mean, myrrh is also a very fragrant perfume, but it also speaks of death. It speaks of death. When Jesus' body was anointed, they brought myrrh to anoint him with. Um, so this is the hill, the mountain of suffering. It's the mountain of death. It's what she was really afraid of in the earlier part of the song when she said, I'm not going with you, okay? I'm okay in the house. I'm okay with this warm, you know, secure, safe with inside, but calling me out to the mountains, that's too much. Don't call me to go there. But now she's like, I will go. I will go to the mountain of myrrh with you. I'm willing. I trust you. Her trust, see how her love is maturing? And she's, she's willing now to go. But she can't get to the mountain of myrrh. And by the way, the mountain of myrrh, this should be very familiar to us from the Gospels. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, right? Anyone who's not willing to come after me, anyone who's not willing to carry their cross cannot be my disciple. He calls us to die, in Bonhoeffer's words, right? When Christ calls a man, he calls him to come and die. We have to die. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground, it remains a single seed. We have to die. We have to go to the mountain of myrrh. But we can't go there unless we first go to the hill of incense. So she talks about the hill of incense. And incense in scripture always refers to, I mean, when it's symbolic, it always refers to the prayers of saints. It's the, the hill of prayer. We have to go onto the hill of prayer so that we're leaning on God, we're depending on God, our prayers are ascending to him. That's our way of, getting, of preparing ourselves. Otherwise, we can never go to the mountain of myrrh with him. But she says, I will go. I'm going to do whatever's necessary to follow you all the way. That's what she's saying, her expression of devotion to him at this point. I'm willing to go to the mountain of myrrh. And I know that to get there, I have to go to the hill of incense. You can't do anything without prayer. Jesus said, without remaining in me, without re relying on me, you can do nothing. So, but she's willing. She expresses this willingness here. And this, this is a beautiful verse. It's a turning point in the, in the song. And as soon as she does this, now notice, she hasn't gone there yet. All she's done is say, I'm willing to go with you. And how does he respond? Right after this, what does he say? He says, you are altogether beautiful. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Now, when we think about this, um, we're still in chapter four of the song. She's still got a ways to go in terms of maturing. We're going to see in chapter five how she's got further progress to make. She's not all the way there yet. She's not perfectly sanctified. She's not in her resurrection redeemed body yet. But he says to her, you are perfect. There is no flaw in you. You are altogether beautiful. And we can see how his heart is so moved by her willingness to go. Even if she hasn't got there yet. 
even if she's not totally perfect. Well, the Lord, how does he see us? We have to hear the Lord Jesus Christ saying these verses to us. Okay? These verses in the Song of Songs are not supposed to be something that you just show up and kind of hear a sermon and they go, oh, that's kind of an interesting poetic, intro. Oh, okay, whatever. This is supposed to come into our prayer language. We're supposed to learn how to, how to use these phrases in our relationship with God. And we need to hear the Lord. We need to read these verses and hear the Lord speaking to us. And when he speaks to us, what does he say? He says, you're beautiful. You are altogether beautiful. You are beautiful in every way. Can we, uh, can, we, can we just quickly turn to your neighbor and just say that to one another? Can you say to your neighbor, you are altogether beautiful. You know, you are, you are flawless. You are flawless. Because the righteousness of the Lord that is imparted to us through his cross is not halfway. It's not partially imparted. It's completely. The righteousness of Christ, the perfection of Christ, is imputed to us through his cross and through our faith. It's not like anything is left wanting. Again, he said it is finished. When he died on the cross, it is finished. And that's how God speaks of us. When God sees you, how does he see you? You know, people talk about he sees us through the lens of his son, Jesus Christ. He sees us through the lens of the cross, and what he sees is us fully redeemed. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees us in our full redemption and glory. And even though right now, those things are only stirring in us, they're only, they're only budding, the beginnings of that sanctification, that fullness are here, but by no means the fullness. But God, even, in, even when we're in the age of growth, do you know God calls things that are not as though they were? And we think of lots of examples of this in Scripture. When, he, when Jesus first met Peter, Peter, I mean, he was, a, he was a fisherman. Peter had so long to go. He was so full of himself. He was so, we see how that played out in those three years. But the first time Jesus met him, he said, Peter, or he said Simon, because his actual original name was Simon. But he said, you're going to be called the rock. You are the rock. You know, he said to Peter, you are the rock. You are the stable one, the firm foundation. I'm going to build my church on you. Well, that, he said that later. But this thing of the, of the rock, he said it right at the beginning of the relationship. Right when per Peter was first coming to him, he called him the rock already. And we know what happened later with Peter. He, he rebuked Jesus for the way of the cross. He tried to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. He uh, denied Jesus three times before a servant girl. He, he was not particularly stable, but Jesus saw where he was going and he said, you are the rock. Jesus uh, did this many times. Uh, God does this many times in scripture. Remember Gideon? Remember the story of Gideon? When God appeared to Gideon, he sent him an angel to Gideon. And what was Gideon doing? He, he was hiding, right? He was hiding in the wine press for fear. He was so afraid of what was going on around him and he was so fearful. And God said to him, what did he say? He said, yeah, he said, greetings, O mighty man, O mighty warrior. That's what he said to Gideon. There's Gideon hiding in fear. He's trembling, shaking, and God says, greetings, O mighty warrior. That's the angel's address to him. And you know, Gideon became a mighty warrior. And Peter became a stable and secure man in the Lord. But the Lord saw at the beginning he saw the end. He saw where things were going. And this is, this is the sense where he says to us, you are altogether beautiful. And I attribute to you right now that full perfection that I purchased for you and that full perfection that you will be walking in one day in glory, the glory that's coming. And he says, I see it already in you. And it moves me so much. You know, how do we normally think that God sees us? God, do you feel like God sees you that way? Do you feel like God's heart is overwhelmed by your beauty when you come to pray, when you come into his presence? Is that, how, is that your sense of how God is responding to you? 
I think a lot of times we feel like God is just kind of indifferent to us, that God isn't really not particularly interested. I mean, who, who are we anyway? Or maybe if God does pay attention, he mostly pays attention to our flaws and our weaknesses, mostly thinks about our sins, mostly kind of preoccupied with how messed up we are, you know, and is kind of disgusted by us. You guys ever had that feeling before God? You know, you come to God's presence and you're like, God, I'm so, I'm so awful, I'm so terrible, I can't even be in your presence, I can't even, you know. How much, how would we feel if when we came into God's presence, you heard the voice of the bridegroom saying, you are beautiful. You are altogether beautiful. You are perfectly lovely in my sight. Would that, would that change your attitude? Would that change how you felt about God? How you related to God at all? Well, let's, let's look at what he says next, okay? There's a bit more here. So I think they actually go to the mountains after this because there he is saying, come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinar, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of leopards. Well, if, if he's now calling her to, to descend with him from the mountains, that means she went to the mountains with him. And these are the mountains of Lebanon. You can look them up. I actually wanted to show you a picture of Mount Hermon because Mount Hermon is the one place in Israel where you can go skiing. It's actually high enough that it's got snow on this mountain. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful high mountain, but very uh, glorious and very scary and dangerous. High peaks, you know, there's, there's mountain lions, there's wild leopards, and uh, very dangerous places that they've been to. Yeah, but she was willing. She was willing to go with him, and they went to the mountains together. And now he's calling her, um, he's calling her down. Do you guys get this? Do you guys get this aspect of the Song of Songs? That when the Lord calls us out, he's call, he calls us to mission. He calls us to some purpose. It might even be a really small thing like, hey, you get the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Hey, I want you to talk to this person. I want you to try to like, you know, share something with this person beside you. And you feel that prompting, right? And you're like, well, we can either go along with it or we can resist. We can go to the mountains with the Lord, the scary places, the challenging places. This could also be just speaking of in our relationship with God, where the Holy Spirit is highlighting these areas of brokenness and darkness in our life, in our relationship. And we don't really want to go there. It's kind of scary. They're kind of like seemingly treacherous and dark places that we don't want to go to. This could be just in terms of our need for emotional healing, the areas of unforgiveness, of bitterness of our heart, the things that we're kind of holding on to that we don't really want to let go of. It could also be the calling of mission, the calling to go out on the mountains, because mountains are not only challenges in scripture, but they're, they're like powers and kingdoms. They represent kingdoms. So God is calling his people to go out on the mountains together. You know, Jesus says to his disciples when he rises from the dead, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. Because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations. And he's talking to this band of, you know, fishermen and agricultural society, people, mostly uneducated people who have been living with him for three years. And he says, I want you to go into all the nations and make disciples. This would be a very intimidating kind of task. And I think when we think about God's calling and God's mission, we often feel very intimidated. We feel kind of scared to do that to take our place, to step up into the place, even to just step out and speak out a word that God has given you, a word of encouragement to somebody else, or, or pray for somebody who's sick, who you see, hey, the Lord's talking to me to pray for this person, maybe I should pray, but, but we resist, right? We're afraid, we're afraid of what are these people gonna think of me? What's it gonna be like? What if I fail? All these kind of fears that we shrink back from, from following the promptings of the Lord, from going with him to the mountains. But then we need this revelation of his security, of his safety, the, the vision of the, of the wedding carriage, of the 60 warriors that are surrounding us, of the absolute protection that we have in the Lord. And I think we also need this sense of God's affirmation, of how important it is to him, these little movements of our heart, little movements of love, Little phrases. Do you ever try like, okay, because look at what he says next. Look what he says next. Let's just do this last section here. He says, you have stolen my heart. 
my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart. With one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. Um, other translations say, you have ravished my heart. You have captivated my heart. What, what, what is he saying here? What, what, what would someone be saying who says this? You have ravished my heart. I am like, I am like uncontrollably, I am like enraptured by you. I can't even, this is, notice that this is not us talking to God. This is God talking to us. You have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. I mean, how can, can you feel God saying this to you? You have ravished my heart. Like when I see one glance of your eyes, when you turn your attention towards me, even one time, my heart is just taken over. I'm captivated by your love. He, now, he, look what he does. He turns around the thing that she said at the beginning of the song. He says, how delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine? That's what she said at the beginning of the song. She said that his love was much more pleasing than wine. And I feel like we get that a lot more easily. We get that. God's love is more pleasing to us than wine, right? God's love is, is good to us. We love God's love more than we love the desires and the delightful things of the world. But what about God saying that to you? That your love to me is much more pleasing than wine than any other source of pleasure or delight, God says. That's how important your love is to God. The movements of your love to God. How, how are you guys doing? This is, right, this is, this is really intense stuff. And I think it's, it's often not what we kind of expect or think from God, right? And... Um, but this is how God feels. We're, what we're seeing in this passage is the unveiling of the heart of God and how he feels towards his people. And you know, we so much need this revelation of God's heart, of how God feels, of what's going on inside of God's heart, because we live in this world where we're so much under the, the spirit of accusation of the evil one. And when, 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 when scripture talks about the devil, our enemy, the devil, it talks about him as the accuser, the accuser, the one who comes against us and says all these things about how we're, how we're bad and how we're wrong and how we're not good enough and how we're a failure. You're a failure. You could never make it. You could never do this. You're not good enough. Look at you. You're a hypocrite. You're hopeless. There's nothing good, right? Our enemy comes against us with all these accusations. What he basically does is hang out and accuse us for the throne of God day and night. That's what Revelation tells us about the devil. That's what he does. He accuses us. And we come under this spiritual darkness because we align ourselves, we listen to the accusations, to the lies of the enemy. And how does that, how do you think, how do you get motivated when you hear that? Is that very motivating to you to follow the Lord, to go deeper in your relationship with God when you think, here I am, I'm a failure, I'm hopeless, there's nothing good about me, I can't do anything anyway, right? There's nothing... Um, Okay, we, we do recognize that in ourselves, those things are all true, actually. I mean, there's like an element of truth in these things because, yeah, we're, we're, we are hopeless. We're hopeless hypocrites. We're sinners in our sinful nature. But that is not the whole story about us when we've been redeemed by the Lord. When he has accomplished his salvation perfectly for us, when he has taken our place and imparted his righteousness toward us, we need to now hear him say who we are in his grace. And what he says is, you are, you are lovely. You are delightful. I delight in your love. Like, I would rather drink your love, the expressions of your love, than any other thing in all of creation. There's nothing in all of creation that God is more desirous of, more passionate about, than receiving your love receiving the movements of your heart towards him, receiving the gaze of your attention to pay attention to him, turn your attention. He said, one glance of your eyes. Later in the song, he's going to say, turn your eyes away from me. They overwhelm me. 
Stop looking at me with that passion and desire of love that I see in your heart because it just I can't even control myself. I'm, God is just overwhelmed by us when, when we love him. And, and again, he talks about the links of her, of her neck, of her necklace, the, the jewels on her necklace. And, and again, he's highlighting the neck and, and her direction. And the fact that she is set on obeying him, the fact that she has set her will to follow him, he is just so moved by this. He says, one link of your necklace, it just throws me for a loop. I'm, I'm head over heels for you. I just think when we think about prayer and we often experience prayer as this boring and dull kind of thing or like at best this like dutiful thing that I do while I'm supposed to pray, go and pray and it's really, and you know, if we know how God responds to our prayer, if we know how God feels about the movements of our hearts to love him, wouldn't, wouldn't that motivate us a lot more to go into prayer, to want to pray? Do you ever try just saying to the Lord, like, I love you, Lord, Jesus, I love you, Lord. Do you know, if you say that to him sincerely, even in a little kind of weak way, I love you, Lord. He goes, oh my goodness, I'm overwhelmed. You're, I, you're, I love this. this. He's overwhelmed by it. He delights in it. It's like, it's like drinking the most pleasant wine to him. That's his heart. That is our God's heart to us. It's how he feels about us. So we really need this revelation because we have to come against the accusations. And, and you know, other people don't see us this way. Other people don't say this to us, right? Oh, you're so beautiful. What do they say? Well, you kind of suck. You're kind of, you got this problem and that problem and you're annoying and I don't like this about you and you're not good enough anyway. And how many voices have we heard? How many criticisms? How many ways do other people come in line with the accusations of the enemy against us? And then they say these things about us. And we hear their voice, right? And we listen to these voices and we internalize this. And maybe this is coming from people that we really expect. Maybe it came from our parents. Maybe these words came from our people who are really important to us. Maybe we had people that we looked up to and they criticize us and they put us down. And, uh, and what should we do, you know? The Lord wants us to not dwell in that place, but to realize that in Christ, there is no condemnation. So if we're sitting there in our, in our guilt and condemnation and, and just kind of dwelling in that, in that darkness, that is exactly where our enemy wants us to be. It's exactly where the Lord does not want us to be. I mean, repentance is good, but the point about repentance isn't to go moping around, focusing on how, how much you suck. That's not the heart state that the Lord wants you to remain in. Do you know that like, like um, excessive guilt and shame and focusing too much on your own sin is a kind of pride? Do you know that? Anybody know that? Because it's not, how, how is that any better than, than boasting about how great you are? If you're just boasting about how great you're like so full of yourself and you think you're so great, that's not good because it's not realistic. It's not what the Lord says. You're trying to be independent of the Lord. But if you're focusing on your sin and your shame and your weaknesses and you're, oh, I suck, I'm terrible, I can't do anything. I'm not... You're denying the power of God's grace. It's like you're saying, my sin is stronger than God's grace. My, my sin is like, oh no, I mean, God's grace, maybe for other people, but not for me. It's not strong enough in my case to really impart righteousness to me because I'm, that's pride. That's pride. Any way that we focus on ourselves too much is pride. We have to look at the Lord. And if the Lord says this about us, if he has this in his heart about us, then that's the most real thing that there is about us. If he says you're beautiful, then you are beautiful. Does anybody else have a better judge of anything than the Lord? So we have to repent of, of that. We have to repent of, of uh, looking down on ourselves. Um, I've skipped around a bit here, and I haven't covered all the details of this. Um, a lot of the things in these last verses, up to verse 11, 
talk about her love, how pleasing her love is, how fragrant her perfume is, her lips dropping sweetness as the honeycomb. You know, milk and honey are under your tongue. So again, it speaks of her words. It speaks of her emotions, of her words, and of her deeds. So the last thing is, is garments. And in scripture, the garments are symbolic. If you look at Revelation uh, 19.8, it talks about um, the clothes that they're wearing rep represent the righteous acts or deeds of the saints. Okay. Um, right? You can see that there. So... Again, right? These are not things that earn us salvation or earn us God's love. God isn't going to love us more because we obey him. But at the same time, it moves him when we obey him. And he cares about it. And he takes that really seriously and personally to heart. And he's moved by it. So if we know that we can move God, if we know that we can delight God, I really hope that this will, will spur us on to just say it. And, and, you know, you can say things to the Lord like, Lord, have you ever said to the Lord in your prayer language? It's like, Lord, I want to obey your ways completely. I want to be 100% obedient to you. I want, Mike was talking last week about walking with the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. Lord, I want to, I want to be in step with the Holy Spirit completely, 100%. I want to go all the way with you. I don't want to compromise even one area of my life. Have you ever said things like that to God? Because even if you're not there yet, if that's in your heart, if that willingness is in your heart, the Lord is moved by that. He is so pleased by that and it delights him. Even when we're in immaturity, even when we're in our weakness, got a long way to grow. And we have that movement of our hearts, the stirring of our heart to love God. He is so touched by it. I was trying to think about this in practically how it relates to me. Because um, sometimes when I'm uh, preparing sermons or doing any kind of form of ministry or anything like that, teaching the Bible, I, I think a lot about like the impact that I'm having. How is this impacting other people? Is this really blessing other people? Is there any noticeable change? Am I helping anybody at all? Am I doing anything good here? And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, and I worry about that and I feel anxious and I think, but what I realized from this is that if God asks you to do something and you do that thing faithfully before him, it moves his heart. And when I think about that, I'm like, Lord, okay, if your heart is moved by me meditating on your word and preaching your word and doing any of these things, trying to encourage somebody else, even if those other people don't even aren't even moved at all. It's worth doing because the Lord is moved. What do I care about more than moving God's heart, delighting God's heart in what I do? That's what our whole life is about. It's about receiving God's love for us, you know, becoming delighted in God and then learning that we delight God and giving ourselves to God and offering ourselves to him even in small, tiny ways. Like, I, I really like to point out that Jesus talked about if, if you gave a cup of cold water to someone because they believed in me, you will get, you know, to, I think he says, like, if you gave a cup of cold water to a prophet or something, you'll get a prophet's reward. If you do some small thing. So it's like the small things count to the Lord. I'm not talking about, like, everyone here, you need to get up right now and go to like the worst war-torn country you can imagine and become a missionary tomorrow and then the Lord will be happy. Right? The Holy Spirit puts something in your heart to tell your mom or your dad, hey, I, I love you, mom. And in obedience to the Holy Spirit, you, you say something. You, you move your heart to honor your parents in some way or to encourage them. It could be just small little things. The point is the Lord cares about them and they matter to him. And these things all matter so much to him. Um, okay, so that's about, that's pretty much what I have here. Um, so, I don't know, is there a mountain in your life that you're aware of? Is there like a place of challenge? A place where you, you know the Lord wants you to follow him? Is there a place the Lord wants to take you deeper in your relationship? Is it, you know, is it about being open and vulnerable to somebody? Sharing things with other people that you don't normally share? Is there, 
Is there a challenge? Is there a mountain? Is there a calling? Is there a mission? Is there, you know, a spiritual gift that the Lord has put in your heart that you know is there that you're kind of holding back from, from, going, from stepping out? If there is, then, you know, you might need to go back and get this more assurance of God's protection and God's goodness. But from today's passage, we need to know how it moves the Lord when we do those things with him and how we partner with him. And we can tell him that, like, Lord, I'm willing to go to the mountain with you. Actually, as we have some time to pray in a minute, I'd like us to focus on that. Just saying to God, affirming to him, because he says, your lips, your words are sweet to me. They're like honey. Um, they're like milk and honey to, to the Lord. When we speak to him out of a sincere heart, we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be perfectly strong. We're going to mess up. We're going to fail. But we say those things to the Lord. Lord, I'm willing. I'm willing to go with you to the mountain. Um, and then, as we grow in the conviction of how we move God and how he loves us, then we can actually step out and go to the mountains with him in the power of his grace. Okay. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, let's take some time to pray. And I just would like us to, um, to speak out whatever the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart to say to God as your devotion to him. Okay. Now, if you're not feeling this, that's okay. Like if, in a way, I feel like this doesn't depend on our feelings because we may not even know how the Lord is moved. But what we know from his word is that he is moved. And so even if I don't feel it, I know that he's moved. And so for the sake of, of just giving him pleasure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things. I'm going to speak out. I'm going to share my heart. How do you feel about him? Turn your eyes to him. Okay, set your heart on him. So we'll take a few minutes to just have some time personally to do that, and then I'm going to wrap up in prayer. Please join me in a prayer. Um, and uh, if you, if you want to follow along with what I'm praying, um, you can feel free to do that. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pray. I just like us to give the Lord something to really delight in this morning. So we came before him to worship him. And um, yeah. So let's, let's do that, okay, from our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for the free gift of righteousness. We thank you that we are beautiful in your sight. We thank you, Lord, that you declare this. Even if we don't feel it, even if we don't really see this, Lord, I pray that your word would overcome all the, the lies and strongholds of our enemy, God, and that we would have a breakthrough to realize what your heart is like for us, God. And Father, right now, we just want to turn our attention to you, Lord. And we just want to say, God, that we trust you, that we trust your leadership in our lives. Lord, I, I trust you to lead me. Lord Jesus, I'm willing to go with you wherever you want me to go because I know that you're good. I know that you care about me and I know that I'm under your protection, Lord. I'm willing to go anywhere, Lord, with you. I know that I'm not strong enough in my own strength to do it, but I'm willing, God. If there's an area of my, my heart that you're challenging me to, to deal with before you, God, I'm willing to go there with you, Lord, even though I don't want to. Lord, if there's uh, circumstances that you want to bring about in my life that are going to be hard and challenging, Lord, I'm willing to go there because I know that you work out all things for the good of those who, who love you. Lord, we turn our eyes to you. We just say that we love you. Jesus, we love you. We worship you, Lord. We lay down our, our hearts before you, Lord. We're willing to give our lives to you, Jesus. I offer my, my time to you, Lord. I offer my heart to you, Lord. I'm willing to sit before you, Lord, in prayer, even if it sometimes feels boring, Lord. I'm willing to give you time to let you move. I'm willing to give my attention to your word, Lord. Lord, I'm willing to uh, step out 
and bless and serve when you're moving me to serve and to bless, God. And I know that you'll provide the strength. And God, I know that you receive all the things that we do in service, even if other people don't seem to receive it well. Thank you for that, God. Thank you that you see all and you know all, and you know our hearts. God, we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you're moved, that your heart is even ravished by one look of our eyes. And we know that you're experiencing that right now, and we don't understand it, Lord. And we think about our weakness and, and failings and how far we fall short. So we, we can't even imagine, Lord, how that could be, but your word says it's true. Lord, thank you that you love us so much, that you called us to be your consecrated bride, to be your partners forever, Lord. Jesus, we want you. We want a greater sense of your presence in our lives, Lord. And we want to live in accordance with what you say, with your heart, with your words, Lord, and not, not with the enemy. So we just want to break off any strongholds right now that, that people have in their hearts. Lord, Holy Spirit, we ask you to come powerfully through your word to just break off those feelings of being uh, shameful, being uh, disgusting, being a failure, um, even just the feel feelings of condemnation, feeling being condemned, feelings of being rejected, uh, feelings of being not good enough, feelings of fear, Lord, all those fears, all those things, we pray that you would break through Holy Spirit and let us hear the word of the Lord. You are altogether beautiful. And uh, your, love, your love is more pleasing to me than, much more pleasing to me than wine. Yes, Lord. We, yeah, we just thank you for that, God. Make this reality come from our heads down to our hearts and into our actual lives and practice, Lord. Just set your people more free. Give us more freedom, Lord, to walk in this uh, in the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I have a couple announcements to share with you guys. Uh, um, if, if people want, if people are experiencing anything, like you feel like something's a bit touched in your heart and you want to pray, um, please pray with somebody before you go today. Okay? <laughs> people who are willing to pray with others, please come up um, after, the, after we're done these announcements, okay, and then and then we can spend some time in prayer. We don't actually have lunch together today. This is our off week, so people can get together and have lunch in groups or however you want to do that. Um, so we'll just conclude um, praying with each other after this. But Okay, so Seeds of Waterloo, 5.30. We've got a few more of these left. We're going up until August 2nd. Um, great way to go onto the mountains. If you need a mountain challenge, invite a friend to come out to this thing and actually come yourself. Okay? Uh, okay? Let's put that out there. Um, Song of Songs group Bible study we have tomorrow, tomorrow night. We're going to go into the next part of the Song of Songs for the next couple weeks worth. Okay? What else? Um, members meeting tonight. So if you are a member of the church, then your attendance is expected, unless you have something else that's really important that can't be changed. Um, to come out to the meeting. It's at 7 p.m. tonight, okay, at the church here. Is that it? Okay, that's it. All right, great. So let's pray, okay? Before you go today, just pray. Get in groups of pairs or threes, or, you know, if you want to come up and pray with me or with anybody else at the front, um, pray over anything that's going on. Uh, do that, okay, before you go today. And that'll be it.